these 10 boys, these young rabbis with healthy appetites, they were eating oranges all Shabbos long. There was no way they were going to transgress and eat something that kosher. Welcome back everybody. A lot of people have been asking about who I am, what's my background, what's my story. So I wanted to share that with you today. Now, truth be told, my story really has a few different overlapping parts and I'm only going to go in one direction today even though each of them is very, very interesting. But before I tell you about my story, I want to tell you a different story. So there's a story about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who was once walking in the woods with his students and he was explaining to them that God orchestrates everything that happens in this world down to the tiniest of details. And he told them, he said, when a leaf falls, it falls because God chose for it to fall. And as a, an example, he told the students to go over to a specific leaf that had fallen upon the forest floor. And when they picked it up, they found a little worm underneath. And the Baal Shem Tov explained to them that that worm had been withering in the summer heat. And God sent this leaf to provide it shade to protect it. You see, God is intimately involved with every single detail in our lives. And nothing happens by circumstance, by coincidence, by serendipity. Everything is divinely orchestrated. And I know I've seen this very much in my own life. I mean, there are things that I don't understand. I can look back and I can say, why did this and this and this happen? But sometimes we just watch all the puzzle pieces fall into place and we say, oh my gosh, this is extraordinary. Sometimes we do get the glimpse of why things happened. So let me share with you some of my story. Let me share with you who I am. And this is done not with the purpose of just talking about myself. Like, who needs that? This is done with the purpose of proclaiming God's name, about how he cares for every single person and how he orchestrates those events to bring us home. So my story is, I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas which ironically means the body of Christ. Out of all places in the world for a Jewish girl to be born, I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. And my family was minimally observant. We knew we were Jewish. We had matzah on Pesach. We had Hanukkah candles on Hanukkah. We ate kosher, meaning that we didn't eat pork. We didn't eat shellfish. But beyond that, I didn't really know the laws of kashas. We had a mezuzah on the door. And we were so proud to be Jewish. Being Jewish was my essence. I loved it. This was who I was. And as I grew up, that was the one thing I always carried with me. I am Jewish. It felt like a very special gift that I was given and I embraced it with everything I had. My family moved around many times for different reasons. There were places that I lived for less than a month. I didn't really have many friends. I never really connected to people. And the truth is that was a very good thing because I'm so happy that I didn't have very close connections to people who might have brought me down. Unfortunately, I saw there was a lot of depravity, a lot of immorality going on in the public school system, which I was exposed to. But because I didn't have close friends, I never really descended into any of that. And I went to public school until I was 14 years old, after which point I said, this is too much for me. I said, I don't want to be in such an environment. And I stopped going to school. I ended up getting my GED. Now, because I didn't have many friends and I moved around many, many different times, there were really two things that were very close to my heart. I loved animals. And the animal that I had, I had my own personal dog. His name was Tikva. It means hope in Hebrew. And that dog was everything to me. We used to go on long, long walks. The other thing that mattered to me was gaining knowledge. I loved to learn. And when I was about 12 years old, I started becoming more interested in Judaism and I started taking out books from the library. By the time I was 14, I was, everything was Judaism to me. Like I was just reading the Tanakh as much as I could. That's what I cared about. I don't know why my soul was so thirsty. I don't understand it to this day. I was, a, I, was, I was a little kid, but I was the type of kid that people would tell me, you're like a 40 year old instead of a 10 year old's body. You're an old soul. You speak just like my grandmother. That's who I was, what should I say? So I was very thirsty. I wanted to grow. 
but I didn't know how to grow. Aside from books I was reading, a little bit of internet access, I was able to dig up some things. I was kind of stuck. And at that point in time, when I was 14 years old, we were living in Bend, Oregon, out in the middle of nowhere. Really out in the middle of nowhere. It was a town of 30,000 people. And I think there was literally a handful of Jews. We were really the anomaly there. And it was very interesting. One day my mother tells me she wants to take my dog and she wants to go hiking up Pilot Butte. Now, there was two very interesting things about this. Number one, my mother wasn't personally attached to my dog. She, she thought he was cute, whatever, but she wouldn't do more than touch him on the nose every now and again. So she wanted to take my dog and she wanted to go hiking up Pilot Butte. Now my mother at that time was, I wouldn't say in the best of shape. So hiking was not one of her hobbies. So it was very odd she wanted to take my dog and go hiking up Pilot Butte. Now to add a third thing into this mix, Pilot Butte was like a lookout point in the middle of Bend, Oregon. And it was known for the KKK cross burnings that they used to hold on the site. It was like the most anti-Semitic place in town, but over the years it just became a standard hiking point. So my mother decides she's going to take my dog and go hiking and she disappears from the house and I get a phone call a little while later and she tells me you won't believe it We got to the top of Pilot Butte and you know what we saw there? There are two rabbis and they're putting tefillin on people. So we told them that we have a Jewish daughter and She's very very interested in Judaism So they asked if they can come over to our house. So they're on the way now so these two rabbis who had been passing through and just happened to have met my mother on the top of Pilot Butte came to our house. They checked our mezuzah, which Baruch Hashem was a kosher mezuzah. And they showed us a video of the Lubavitch Rebbe. And then I got to sit and talk with them and I was asking them questions. And I remember the one question that I asked them, I said, I want to understand something. I want to understand how it's possible to purify somebody who came into contact with something dead through something dead. I was speaking about the red heifer, the paraduma, and these two rabbis just looked at each other and they said, whoa, we have to get you somewhere to learn. And then they went their way, but they called me a day or two later. And they said, you know, we saw that there are a few Jews here and we saw that you're very interested in Judaism and we're bringing down a menion for Shabbos. We're bringing down a quorum of 10 and we are going to make a synagogue in somebody's house and we're inviting you to come spend Shabbos with us. So it was unbelievably beautiful. Out in the middle of Bend, Oregon, in the middle of nowhere where there was a strong KKK presence, historically speaking, these 10 rabbis came down and they made a Shabbos, especially for me. I mean, the few Jews in town were invited, but I was the only one who showed up. So I had an entire shul just for myself. And it was the most moving experience of my life. I think the thing that stuck out to me most is that these rabbis have put up a cholent over Shabbos, for Shabbos. But the electricity wasn't working. It seemed that the outlet was not good or something. So they ended up not even having their food. And you had these 10 young rabbis who didn't have access to their food. And they were inside of somebody's house that was not kosher and they were eating their full lavish meals. But these 10 boys, these young rabbis, with healthy appetites, they were eating oranges all Shabbos long. There was no way they were going to transgress and eat something not kosher. And when I saw that strength, I was so impressed. I said, ah, this is what it means to be Jewish. And then of course, there was being in the atmosphere where they were reading the Torah, and when the sun was going down, they were singing these beautiful heartwarming songs. And I just said, this is truth. This, this Shabbos, this is so beautiful. This is truth. I want this. And I strengthened in my journey. At that time, I didn't really know much about what Shabbos was. I didn't know how to keep it. So I was still continuing in my life. But I wanted, I wanted to grow. A few months later, my family ended up moving to Pennsylvania. Um, and there was a Chabad house, a synagogue, about eight miles from where we were. So I told my mother, I said, I really want to go. I really want to go um, to another synagogue. I loved it. I want to be around it. This is something that I crave. 
So my mother, my mother told me, she said, no problem, I will take you one time. So we ended up driving over there on Shabbos and I experienced Shabbos there. But then my mother, after that experience, she told me, she said, you know, it's really not okay to be driving on Shabbos. So if you want to go again to an Orthodox synagogue, then we need to be able to be within walking distance. And that just can't happen around here in Pennsylvania. So it was another few months before we ended up moving from Pennsylvania and we moved to Bellevue, Washington. And once we were in Bellevue, Washington, we were only five miles away from the local synagogue, Rabbi Farkash Yeshua. So I told my mother, I said, okay, now we have no excuse. It's not eight miles. We can walk five miles. So my mother and I started walking every Shabbos morning, five miles to Shul, which took about two and a half hours. And it happened to have been really, really fun. People thought we were crazy but I so much wanted to be in shul. And my mother and I, we had this great bond when we walked together. And we just, we fell in love with going to shul every week. And eventually I told Rabbi Farkash, I said, you know, I really want to go learn how to be fully religious. At that time I was already Sharma Shabbos. I was keeping all the halachas to the best of my ability, but I wanted to know more. Actually, I want to tell you a few funny stories while we're on the topic. So part of this growth process about becoming from about, you know, learning how to keep the different laws comes with foibles. So I remember when I first learned that you make a bracha over everything you eat, I heard the phrase, you make a blessing over everything you eat. So I thought that you had to make a blessing over every single bite. So I remember I was sitting and watching TV one night and I was having like a bag of Skittles or something. I don't know. So every single candy, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, it was very funny. Another thing that I had learned is that you're not allowed to carry on Shabbos. So I didn't know what the parameters of that meant. So I remember I needed a Tylenol that was high up on a shelf inside of a, a box with medication. And um, I had to get it. So what did I do? I said, I can't carry it. So I knocked it off the shelf and sent all the bottles flying. <laughs> yeah, it was very funny. I didn't know. I was I was trying to serve with a very pure heart, but I was lacking in knowledge. So a lot of funny stories like that. Every balas tshuva or every bal teshuva has those stories. So um, so I told Rabbi Farkash I wanna I wanna go learn. I really want to be in a strong learning environment. So he sent me out to New York to Crown Heights, to a um, a Lubavitcher women's yeshiva, and I was there for a year. Now, I was going through a lot of things in life. As, as I said, I did not have a typical childhood. We were moving around constantly. There were times also that we, really, we were really in very hard situations. There were times I lived in a trailer without running water. There were times we lived in a place where I just had a mattress on the floor. And then when I went to Crown Heights, um, there was a time that I had absolutely no money. And it was basically I got a loaf of bread for the week and a jar of peanut butter. When I ran out, I was done with food for the week. So times were not always easy. And then of course, there are those other two major parts of my story that I'm not even going into now. So life was not necessarily easy, but I was laser focused on what I wanted. I, I wanted to be the best possible Jew that I could be. So I went to Crown Heights and I was there for a year, but at the same time, I was still healing from so much trauma that I had gone through as a child in so many different ways that we're not even going to get into. And I can't say that I was fully balanced. I wasn't fully settled. And one of the things that I carried with me is I was full of shame. I was full of the shame for the fact that I wasn't the same as everybody else. I mean, I was in a school for Bali Teshuva and in that aspect, I was the same, but I didn't want to be the same as them. I wanted to be the same as the from from birthers, the people who are born into Judaism. I was so jealous of them. That's not fair. They got to be born into the perfect family. At that point in time, I didn't realize that there is no such thing as a perfect family or perfect community. But I was very jealous and I had to prove to myself that I could be just as good as them. So I went very extreme. I have to learn the most. I have to be the most modest. I have to be top, 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 top. And eventually this led me to leaving the Chabad community, the Lubavitcher community, and moving into Williamsburg, which is a very, very Hasidic community. It's known as one of the most Hasidic communities out there. And I went 
into not only the most Hasidic community, but into one of the most Hasidic families out there. One of the families that is very, very well known and they were so sweet. They kind of like adopted me as their own daughter. They married me off. They, you know, they really helped me establish my family. And I'm deeply appreciative to them for that. So for 16 years, I lived inside the Hasidic community and I pushed myself into a box that was not natural for me. I pushed myself into being ultra, ultra religious, into, into looking and sounding just like everybody else, to the point that I lost my personality, to the point that I was just a cookie cutter because I felt shame over who I was shame over what I had gone through in life, shame that I wasn't good enough. So I forced myself to be good enough. And I didn't realize that that's not what God wanted of me. God wants us to be different. He wants us to have our unique experiences. And they're orchestrated in order for us to reach the point in life, wherever we need to be, at whichever specific point in time we need to be at it. But I couldn't embrace my past. I couldn't embrace who I was. So I just kept faking and slowly I was dying inside. I didn't speak to my kids in English. I spoke only Yiddish. I forced myself to dress in ways that were not in accordance with my natural soul. I forced myself into rules that were not based upon the Torah, but upon community standards. I lost myself. And while I was trying to fit myself into this box, I was also trying to fit my family into the box. Because that box was presented as so holy and so good. And I'm not going to say it's not. I'm not going to say that there's anything wrong with it. But I'm going to say that people don't have to fit inside of boxes. And people are certainly not supposed to be cookie cutters. Every single Jew is created to be a leader in some aspect. We're not just created to be followers. And eventually, it reached a point where my family was under tremendous stress. And we reached out to Rabbi Manus Friedman. And he really swooped in and saved the day. He got us to rip everything apart by the seams. He got us to reevaluate, to question. He said, what is Yiddishkeit? And what is Frumkeit? Yiddishkeit is your relationship with God. That's, that's Judaism. That's following the Torah. It's about coming closer to Hashem every single day. Frumkeit, Frumkeit is religiosity. It's living for other people's standards, things that the community developed over time that are not based upon Torah. He said, Frumkeit is not important. It's Yiddishkeit that's important. It's about constantly growing, coming closer to God, doing your mitzvahs, and developing that relationship. And he got us to completely just switch our focus. And he said, every person has a natural degree of frumkeit. Every person has their natural degree of relig religiosity. He said, stop trying to contort yourself to fit somebody else's box. Just be yourself, just be, let yourself be. And you're going to hit your own natural degree of religiosity. And that is so true. Once I just let myself relax, all of a sudden, everybody's opinion stopped mattering to me. All of a sudden, I came to accept myself and I was no longer living for what people expected of me. I had been motivated by shame for so long. Shame for who I was. Shame for what I had gone through. Shame for the fact that I wasn't the same as everybody else. And it took me a very long time to just accept I am who I am because that's who God wants me to be. And God loves me so much that he made sure to send out rabbis who should not have been in the middle of Bend, Oregon. At the specific time, my mother went hiking with my dog, a pilot butte, in order to bring me to the point that I could come to know God more. It's a beautiful thing, really. It's really a beautiful thing. When I stop and I look back on my life, I can say I've made mistakes. I've had unclear thinking at times. But I can also say that everything was orchestrated from above. And even the things that were painful 
even those lack of clarity moments, they were all for a purpose. And each step along my journey has been in order to get me to this point. And again, I can look back and I can see some of the puzzle pieces interlocking and I can say, oh, that happened for this reason, that happened for this reason, that happened for this reason. There's some things that I don't understand. But you know what God does? And God puts us exactly where we're supposed to be at different times. This, of course, is just the short version of my story. I'm leaving out a lot of detail. But what I wanted to share with you is that for so long I'd been motivated by shame and there was no reason for that shame. There was really no reason for that shame. God created me to be who I am because who I am is precious to him. And only I can do what I can do in this world. And once I came to embrace that, all of a sudden, he revealed superpowers inside of me that I never knew I had. And the same thing goes for every single one of us. We don't have to be ashamed of who we are, where we come from. The only thing that we have to be ashamed of is if we don't live up to our potential. And even then, it shouldn't be this horrific negative thing where we get into the cycle of, okay, I'm so bad anyway, so let me go and do more bad and more bad and more bad. No. I think the most powerful thing that was ever told to me was told to me by Rabbi Manus Friedman when I was going through a particular challenge about two years ago. I was really struggling with something and Rabbi Manus Friedman looked me in the eye and he told me a phrase that changed my life. I think you're capable of more, he told me. I think you're capable of more. You see, sometimes we get stuck in our own, in our own negative self-image. And we think, I've reached the capacity of what I can be. I can't be more than this. I'm low. I'm not the same as everybody else. I have a shameful past. I have things that I've done that are so bad or something inside of me is so broken. But that's not the way God sees it. God says, yes, you have so many handicaps. Yes, yes, yes. You didn't even ask to be born. Why should you be down here on this earth? The only reason you're down here is because God has a job for you specifically that only you can do. And yes, there are going to be things that rise up to try to stop you from doing it. It's the Sahara. It's just the difficulties of this finite physical world trying to get in the way, blocking your light from coming out. But if you tap into it, if you let that fire burn, what can you accomplish? So this is a message I want to pass on to each and every one of you. If you have blockages in life, if you have things that you feel guilty about, that you feel shamed about, that you hate yourself about, don't let it control your life. You were created for a reason. And inside of you is a perfect diamond. It's just it's locked up. But you are capable of more. You can overcome. And you can really light this world on fire. With your fire, with your passion, with your soul. You were created for a reason. So let's all embrace our mission. Embrace who we are. No shame. Go forward one footstep at a time. We are all so powerful and we can change this world. Let's shed some more light.